Good evening, Promise. It's great to be here with you guys. Well, I guess I'm here every week with you guys, but it's great to be here with tonight with you guys. <laughs> um, man, when we were worshiping, I just, um, I was just really impressed that I want, that the Lord wants you to know that you're not here by mistake and that um, he wants to tell you something tonight. Um, yeah, and I just want to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we are here tonight. I thank you for everybody that's here tonight because I don't think that any of us are here by mistake. Lord, I thank you for your worship. I thank you that we can come freely and boldly before your throne. Lord, that we can lay down the things that bind us and the things that inhibit us and the things that um, draw our eyes away from you, God, and we can just lay them down at your throne and that we can just look at you. Father God, knowing that we are forgiven and that we have um, that freedom because of your son, Jesus Christ. And God, I just pray tonight that you would um, just use my words to speak your truth to the hearts and lives of these people tonight. Father, may you be glorified. May you be honored in your name. Amen. So if I asked you tonight to define community, how would you define that? Would you define it as the town that you live in? Would you define it as the church that you go to? Would you define it as the people that you work, work with? Um, the Oxford Dictionary defines community in a couple of different ways. First, it defines community as a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common. So I would put this in the category as a town or the place where you live. The second uh, definition is a feeling of is a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. So I would put this into the category of church or work. I think the first community definition of community, our town, is kind of like a broad community. We don't know everyone in town, but we might know our neighbors and those living around us. Seth and I moved to Shakopee three years ago, and we're still getting to know our neighbors. I cannot tell you the names of the people that live on either side of us because they've changed recently. My grandparents, on the other hand, lived in the same town from the time they were married all the way to the time that they passed away. And when I would go over to their house, you would hear them telling stories about so-and-so went to the store yesterday and they bought this and that and or they went out of town and they did this and that and did you see what they were growing in their yard and you just could get all sorts of stories about the people in their town. The second definition of community, however, the definition of fellowship and sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals leads us to our church community and our work community. And this community, you know their names um, you know who they are. You might even know their family or their kids or their grandkids. You might have a close enough relationship with them to know their likes and their dislikes. You might even know them uh, well enough to know their birthday and their anniversary. And the title of my message tonight is Not Alone in the Fire, The Importance of Community. And I was talking to my friend Michelle one day at work, and she was having a particularly rough day. And while I was talking to her, I was encouraging her that she was not alone in the fire, that I was there with her. And I was impressed when I was talking to her that that would make a good message. And so I kind of wrote it down on a sticky tab and had it on my computer for a while. And see, we often have days where we feel like we're going through things and no one truly understands what we're going through. But we're not alone in those times. Tonight, we're going to journey with four Hebrew boys experiencing the same thing and realizing that they're not alone in the fire either. To give you some background, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, otherwise known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were all taken captive from Jerusalem, and they were taken to Babylon. They were removed from their home, their family, and everything that they knew. They were taken to a foreign land. They, were, they went from nobility to captivity. 
but they were the four musketeers, as I call them. And we find their story in the first three chapters of Daniel. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were chosen to serve in the royal palace. And in order to do this, they were given a special diet. They were given special foods to eat, and they had to train in the language and the literature in Babylon. These four, however, didn't want to eat the food that they were told to eat. They wanted to have a special diet, and that was their request. And most of you, if you know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, know that that wasn't really what they wanted, the person overseeing them wanted to do, but he allowed them to do that. And we know that God blessed Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with health and strength with the food that they ate versus the food that everyone else ate. For Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they became a community. They endured challenges and trials together. And my first point tonight is that when you have a community, you face trials together. In Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And he wants the dream interpreted, but he didn't want to tell what his dream was. So he calls his astrologers and his wise men together, and he says, tell me what my dream was and tell me what it meant. Well, of course, this is an outrageous request, right? And they tell him that. They're like, nobody can do that. Nobody can tell you what your dream was and then interpret it. So King Nebuchadnezzar got really mad and decided, you know what, off with their heads. Everybody's, all the wise men are going to die. And, of course, this included Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so this is where we pick up in our story in Daniel chapter 2, verse 14. It says, When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, came to kill them, Daniel handled the situation with wisdom and discretion. He asked Arioch, Why has the king issued such a harsh decree? So Arioch told him all that had happened. Daniel went at once to see the king and requested more time to tell the king what the dream meant. Then Daniel went home and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, what had happened. He urged them to ask the God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling them the secret so they would not be executed along with the other wise men of Babylon. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were facing certain death. In Daniel chapter 1, we learn that God had given Daniel the ability to interpret dreams and the, the meaning of visions. And so Daniel, facing this big challenge, he goes to his friends, which is his community, right, and asks for prayer. Daniel knows that his ability to interpret dreams does not come from himself. He did not give himself the ability to interpret the king's dreams, but rather it had come from God. And when faced with hard tasks or big circumstances, it's helpful to have a community to go to to help you pray through and talk through and walk through that situation so that you aren't facing it by yourself. Could Daniel have done it by himself? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, he could have. Daniel could have gone to his prayer closet and he could have prayed and asked God for the, the wisdom that he needed, that what the dream meant, and for the interpretation. But he didn't. He chose to enlist his friends, his community, to come alongside and support him and help him in the challenge. You see, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had already faced adversity together. They had already been taken captive to a strange land. They had already had their identity stripped away from them when they were given new names. They had all been forced to rely on each other for community. It made sense then that when faced with this outrageous obstacle that they face it together. Now, Promise has a group of ladies that has a great sense of community as well. We send out scripture verses and occasionally a funny good morning text message picture but we also send out prayer requests, and we follow up on those prayer requests as they come through. We encourage one another when we know that each other is struggling with something. We know that, it, I know that at the beginning of the month, I have ladies praying for me to help me get through my billing period because it's kind of stressful. 
We have a community of ladies who are united together from different walks of life for a common purpose, and that is to encourage and build each other up. We have faced adversity together, and it has drawn us together. I think of the town of Burnsville, who recently lost two police officers and one firefighter in a tragic event. And if you've watched the news at all, you saw an outpouring of support from people all over the Twin Cities and beyond who expressed their deep condolences for the people and the families who lost these three men. You saw police and firefighters line up to say goodbye when they saw the men, whether they knew the men personally or not. There was a community, a bond, between the men and their fallen brothers because of the occupation that they had. Those who expressed support for the family, they lined up on the streets. They paid their respects to the fallen heroes, whether they knew them or not. This created a community for the families impacted by the tragic event. It was a community created out of tragedy, but it was also a community showing that these three families they didn't have to walk alone, that their loved ones would be remembered, and that they had a community surrounding them, and that they were going to face it with them. If we move on to Daniel chapter 3, we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar created. And if you've grown up in church, you no doubt are familiar with the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But a quick recap for you. King Nebuchadnezzar gets a little full of himself and builds this idol that he wants everyone to bow down to. And he orders everyone to bow down when they hear the musical instruments blow. So all the noble people surrounding this idol bow down except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they're standing there, and this causes all sorts of challenges for them. And so we pick up the story here in Daniel 3, verses 12 through 15. And just for reference, this is some of the astrologers speaking that, are, that went to the king telling on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're kind of like little tattletales. They say, but there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my God or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power. King Nebuchadnezzar here has placed himself in a position to be worshipped. And he shows his true colors when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to bow down. This is the second time in chapter three, 2 and chapter 3 where scripture both, both times says, that King Nebuchadnezzar got angry. So we know King Nebuchadnezzar is kind of full of himself, and he's kind of an angry guy. Um, he's angry, and he declares, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? As if to say, who is greater than me? King Nebuchadnezzar didn't know that point two, God is in the fire. King Nebuchadnezzar has Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bound and thrown into the furnace. He has a furnace turned made seven times hotter than normal. It killed the guards that threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire, instead of burning up, they were walking around with God, just kind of chilling in the heat, right? Seth and I were talking about this on the way to church. Seth's like, do you think that they saw God in the heat because they're just kind of walking around in, in the fire? I'm like, I think so. I don't know. It doesn't tell us, but I would think they did. But they're just chilling in the heat. See, when the world and life turn up the heat, we need to remember that we have the God who walks with us in the fire right beside us. Can I say that one more time? 
When the world and life turn up the heat, we need to remember that we have the God who walks with us in the fire right beside us. Because there are days when life seems to throw some really challenging things our way. And we wonder, truly wonder, how much more can we handle? This week was a super challenging week for me. I had training that was supposed to go on Tuesday, and it went, that was supposed to be it. It was supposed to end on Tuesday, and it went Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday morning, and it was super challenging. And then my mom ends up in the hospital, and it was like, God, what, what else? How much more can you give me? How much more of this trial it felt like can I take? But if we realize that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that God is able to help us and to save us, we can walk confidently through the trial. If I can realize through this week that God is with me, I can walk confidently through my week, right? There was a missionary named William Carey, and after William Carey was well-established in his pioneer missionary work in India, he, his supporters in England sent a printer to assist him. And soon the two men were turning out portions of the Bible for distribution. Carey had spent many years learning the language so that he could produce the scriptures in the local dialect. He had also prepared dictionaries and grammars for use of his successors, people that would come after him. And one day while Carey was away, a fire broke out and completely destroyed everything that he had done. It destroyed the building, the presses, the Bibles, the manuscripts, the dictionaries, the grammars, everything. And when he returned, he was told about the fire and all that he had lost, but he showed no sign of despair or impatience. Instead, he knelt and he thanked God that he still had the strength to do the work over again. He started immediately, not wasting a moment in self-pity. And before his death, he had du duplicated and even improved on his earlier achievements. Kerry could have wondered why everything he worked for was just gone. But he knew that God was with him in that fire. Can we take a look at what walking around in the fire with God is like? Because this just amazes me. Daniel chapter 3, verse 24 to 27 says, But suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, Didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men, unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. When I was practicing, when I was running through this message earlier today, I got to stop. When I was running through this message earlier today, that sentence just brought me to tears. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. They weren't stuck there. They weren't stuck in the fire. And you know what? Sometimes it feels like we're stuck in the fire. But they stepped out of the fire. They weren't there eternally. Right? Hallelujah. I'm so thankful that there's a step out of the fire. Then the high officials... Um, officers, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads had singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even sell a smell of smoke. If we look at verse 25, we know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been bound and thrown into the fire. But verse 25 says they were unbound. Sorry. Verse 25 says they were unbound, but they were, and they were walking around freely. The, the God with us in the fire is the God of freedom. He comes in and he removes the chains and the weights and the ropes that so easily bind us. The God in the fire comes and gives us freedom to move about unharmed and unbound. They were not hindered in the fire. They were not 
contained in the fire. They had freedom. They had freedom to walk out of the fire. They were able to walk out of the fire because God was there with them. Look at verse 27. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and their bodies had not been harmed. Not a hair of their head had been singed. Their bodies were not, their robes were not scorched and there was no smell of fire on them. God had not only freed them from the cords that bound them, but he also made it that there was no remnant of fire on them when they left the fire. If you've ever, I don't know if you guys have ever done this, but I've done it a time, just once, it only takes once, singed your hair, it smells really bad. I don't recommend it. It smells awful, and it stays with you for a little while. Same thing with the smell of smoke. If you, even if their robes had not been burned, they didn't smell a fire. If you've ever been around somebody that smokes, that smell kind of lingers. It kind of stays with you, right? They came out of the fire not smelling like smoke. Hair without, that hadn't been singed. It hadn't been touched. They came out of the fire like they had gone in, except they weren't bound. Right? God didn't take Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the fire, though. He didn't remove the trial that they were going through. He didn't remove the circumstances because he was in the middle of the fire with them. He removed the chains and he protected their bodies so that what was going on around them, the fire would not harm them. Now, I'm not going to promise that every fire in your life will not, you will not come out unsinged. Because you know what? There are some fires in our lives that will singe us. There are some circumstances and th some things in our life that will cause us to be a little smoky. But I will, however, promise that every fire in your life, God will be with you. One other thing I want to point out with this. When they're in the fire, Nebuchadnezzar, the one who put them in the fire, saw God. And when we're in the fire, don't belittle or don't think little of who's seeing God work in your life. Amen? Not only is God with you in the fire, not only was God with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, but we have our community in the fire with us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not in the fire alone. Not only did they have the one God who could rescue them from the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar and the blaze of the fire, but they had each other. And my final point is that we don't stand alone. Since being taken captive, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had stood together with Daniel. They knew each other. They had a common bond that tied them together. They had faced adversity together. They prayed together. They even served in a fairly prominent leadership position together. Their community of three, four if you count Daniel, was pretty tight. So when faced with another challenge, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego once again faced this challenge together. They stood up together against the bowing down to an idol. They could have chosen to blend in with the crowd, and no one would have been the wiser, but they would have known. King Nebuchadnezzar called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to himself together as a group. He didn't call them out individually. He called them together. They did not face King Nebuchadnezzar alone. And he accused them of not bowing down to the golden image. And together, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king. Daniel 3, 16 through 18 says this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. In these verses, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego respond in unison. One isn't identified as speaking for the group. One isn't identified as objecting or saying, you know... Uh, I'm good. I think I'll just go back and just bow down and oh, I'll be good. Um, no, 
together they faced the adversity. And together they knew that if one was going in the fire, they were all going in the fire. Together they spoke up and together they relayed to the king that even if they faced death, even if they were to die, they knew they served, they, they knew who they served. And King Nebuchadnezzar had tried to minimize the God they served by saying, what God will be able to rescue you from my power? King Nebuchadnezzar was a powerful king, no doubt, but he was trying to take on the God of the universe. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew who they served, and they also knew that even if their God didn't rescue them, they were in this together. Community is formed doing life together. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lived together. They handled adversity together. They grew together. In order for us to be able to stand with one another in community, we have to do life together Promise has established once a month potluck services where we have amazing food and fellowship. Tonight's one of them. We want everybody to stay because there's lots of food. It gives us opportunity to eat together and talk together and catch up on life together. And we're creating community with one another. Community that bonds you together. The more you come together, the more you do life together. And the tighter your community is. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not, neg- not, le- let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Paul here is encouraging us to make a point to come together for worship and fellowship. He knew the importance of meeting together and creating that community. Some of you may know that, or some of you, most of you probably know, that I have been on a weight loss journey the last six and a half months. And on this journey, I found a community of supporters that I didn't know that I had. Well, I should probably rephrase that because they are my coworkers and friends and family, so they've always been in my life. But they have become my cheerleaders and supporters on this journey. There are days when they bring in really, really, really good-looking treats to work, and I really want one of them. And my coworker will look at me and go, it's not worth it. And it helps me to stay on track. And I just hit a huge milestone this week, and my prayer group wants to walk, for my celebration, wants to walk the Waconia Hill. And I know that I'm not walking alone in that. I know that my community of support has stood with me and continues to stand with me and support me as I continue to get healthier. We're not standing alone. If you want to come up and just play something. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood before the king and boldly proclaimed, we're standing together. Community, doing life together, gives us the ability to to boldly proclaim, we're standing together. As a body of believers, a community, we face challenges together. We face trials together. When someone is sick or going through a difficult time, we walk through that event with them. We pray with them or help them any way we can. We also know that even in the fire, the trials, the challenges, God is there. We're not alone. We can trust that if we have faith in God, he is standing with us in the fire. And finally, we can surround ourselves with brothers and sisters who encourage us, who pray with us, who stand with us, and remind us that we're not alone. Because there's another in the fire Standing next to me There is another in the waters Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free There is across the bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire 
another in our fire. You're standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. We all stand and sing this with me. And I can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between wears thin. I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in. And nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between. There is another in the fire. He's standing next to me. There is another in the waters. He's holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in the fire. Oh, there is another in my fire. There is another in the fire. of others in our lives. Lord Jesus, as we leave this place, as we gather for a time of food and fellowship, we ask your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.